Hi everybody, it's Chris Morosky and this video is on how to be best prepared to assist us with a vaginal delivery while on your OBGYN clerkship rotation. This video is designed to be used as part of the orientation for the Yukon School of Medicine students doing the OBGYN clerkship. So let's jump right in. This video is going to be super helpful to you in trying to increase your probability that you're going to be able to assist us taking care of one of our patients through a vaginal delivery. All right, first things first, everybody. I just want to set the bar for what the definition of you assisting us with the vaginal delivery actually is. I think in your minds right now, you're sort of thinking you're going to be right there in front of the patient. You're going to have your gloves on. You're going to be ready to go, and that baby's going to come out, and you're going to catch that baby, and you're going to hold it up, and you're going to put it on that mom's belly all by herself. Well, that's not happening. So let's just turn that around right now. Um, babies are slippery, babies are kind of a hot commodity, and we want to be right there with you, assisting you doing that delivery, like hands on hands. So my definition for you in terms of actively assisting with the vaginal delivery is this. If you are touching any part of the baby as it comes out of the patient's vagina, you can go home that night and call your mother and say, I delivered my first baby today and they're going to be all excited when really in your heart and my heart we know you didn't deliver any of that baby. Um, in all sincerity what it's going to look like is you're going to be sort of right next to me. You're going to have your hands on the baby's head. I'm going to have my hands over your hands. We're going to gently guide that baby out of the pelvis and do the delivery and if at the end for any reason I got to kind of bump you to the side to make sure that baby ends up on the abdomen and not on the floor, well that's going to happen and don't worry about that. If you want to be really good at the masterful art of delivering babies, well, that's where you decide to be an OBGYN or family medicine doctor. So think about that. Okay, so now we've got sort of the definition of your assisting a vaginal delivery down. Let's talk about some of the first steps towards you being involved and that close that you're going to be assisting uh, me doing a vaginal delivery. So this really starts with when the patient gets admitted to the hospital or if you're coming on shift and she's already admitted. The first thing you want to do is meet the patient. Um, it's really important that you meet the patient um, when she's um, comfortable, when she's um, covered and has her modesty preserved, um, and that you can very professionally go in and introduce yourself to the patient. Let the patient know that you are one of the medical students, that you are on the labor and delivery team, that you will be part of her care throughout her whole entire labor, and that you'll be present for the delivery. Um, ask her some simple, easy questions. You can take her history. You can ask her about the pregnancy. If she's got other kids, um, moms tend to love talking about their kids. If there's a partner in the room with her, introduce yourself to the partner. Ask what the relationship is. Um, ask how the pregnancy's gone. If she's had complications. If she's got concerns about her labor and delivery, let her know all of those things. Um, if you've read up on fetal heart rate tracings and you can see some of the monitoring, you can let her know a little bit about there's the baby up there. Everything looks really good. Um, and just tell her how you're going to be involved, that you're going to be checking in on her every two hours, you're going to be writing notes uh, every two hours, you're going to be there for some of the exams, maybe some of the ultrasounds if they're needed, and that your plan is to be there for the delivery. And also just let her know that you're going to be directly supervised by my residents or myself um, during that whole entire process. So that's number one that's really important. The other thing that's really important, maybe even before you meet the patient, is meet that patient's labor and delivery nurse. Labor and delivery nurses, I'm telling you, have the best jobs and have the hardest jobs in the whole entire hospital. They are assigned usually one-to-one -one with their patients, and not only do they have one patient, the mom, but they've got two patients. They've got the mom and the baby at the same time. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the hospital. Um, also, they've got to start carrying these patients across their bed and into crazy different positions, paralyzed with epidurals. They've got all sorts of charting. They've got all sorts of things they need to do for the day. And so the best thing you can do is early on introduce yourself to that labor and delivery nurse. Let her know you're the student that's assigned to that patient for the day that you're going to be in and out. And one of the best things you can do is ask that nurse what you can do for her or him and that patient throughout the course of the labor, whether it's getting ice chips, getting popsicles, getting blankets, getting towels, getting vomit bags, whatever it is. If you can make that nurse's life better, she is going to take care of you throughout the whole entire labor and when it comes down to time for delivery. So introduce yourself to the patient and introduce yourself to the labor and delivery nurse. 
Okay, so I just real quick want to talk about like why medical students don't deliver babies, right? Why don't you guys, why aren't you there? Why do you miss the delivery? Um, a lot of students will say, oh, it's because the patient doesn't want a student involved in the delivery. I can tell you at our birthing hospitals, they understand that education is really important part of medical care. And most of our patients are going to be very supportive of you being involved in their labor and delivery. Um, if they get to meet you and know, you would know that you're supervised. So that's not it. Um, the other thing that medical students um, sometimes won't be able to deliver the baby is if certain things occur at the time of delivery, right? So you guys are really going to be like involved with spontaneous vaginal deliveries. But if a patient needs an operative vaginal delivery to be delivered by a vacuum or forceps, that's probably not a time we're going to be able to have you guys actively involved. Um, if there's a cord around the baby's neck, and we're going to cover that in a different sort of top time, um, you guys can be involved. We're probably going to be able to reduce it, but there are times where that's just not a great time to have a medical student right side by side doing the delivery, or if there's a shoulder dystocia. So there's a few medical reasons why we won't have you guys participate in the delivery. But the number one reason that medical students miss deliveries is that you guys aren't ready for the delivery. And what do I mean by ready? Basically, I mean that you're not there with your protective personal equipment on. So when you're participating in a vaginal delivery, I always like to say every single fluid that is in the human body can fly at you and get on you in that moment. So it can be blood, it can be urine, it can be stool, it can be vomit. Uh, cerebral spinal fluid is probably not coming out of the epidural, but it's, it's in the mix. And so for your safety, uh, those around us and the patient, we need you to be gowned and ready to go with all of your personal protective equipment. So I just want to go over like what does that mean? Um, it certainly means that in the era of coronavirus, um, at all of our birthing hospitals, you need to have an N95 mask on. Um, even if the patient's um, tested negative for COVID-19, you still need to have your N95 mask. Um, and then over that mask, you're going to want to wear a mask that has a face shield, okay? Or a, a surgical mask, procedure mask, plus a separate eye covering. But it's going to look something like this. Um, you also are going to want to cover your hair, so get one of the hair coverings. All, right, all of our hospitals, we have these little bouffants. So you're going to want to put your bouffant on and then have your mask on. And then the other thing that you're going to want to put on are the boots. Now, there are these little shoe covering things that you're going to wear sometimes to surgery. But for a vaginal delivery where a flood of amniotic fluid is going to come upon you, you want to wear these boots. You want to use these big boots that go up knee high. All right. So make sure you know where these are and find these and put these on, okay? We need two of them. So really, those are like the basics. And while you're pushing with the patient, and I'm gonna show you how to do that in a second, you can have your bouffant on, you can have your mask on, kind of tying in the back just like this and ready to go so that you can flip it on um, right when it's delivery time. Hopefully you got, you know, you're gonna have an N95 on with the patient pushing anyway. So you got your N95 on, you got this ready to go for delivery your hat on, you got these real fancy boots on. Now, believe me, your feet are going to get hot and sweaty in these, but that's okay. You're not going to miss the delivery. Last but not least, I don't have it with me. You need to get your own gown and get your own gloves, okay? The nurses are going to pull a gown and gloves for me. They might pull a gown and gloves for my resident, but it's just one of those things of culture that you got to get your own gown and gloves. So you need to know where in the room is the are the gowns, where in the room are the gloves. You need to know your glove sizes. Um, you either can put that on the delivery table if you are committed to keeping that sterile or you can just kind of put that off to the side, all right, and just have that ready to go when it's delivery time. So what that's going to look like right after I show you about pushing and as we get into like how to deliver the baby, once it's time for delivery, right, so once you're done pushing and it looks like the head's about to deliver when we're calling in the resident and the attending, um, you're going to sneak over and you're going to put on your gown and you're going to put on your gloves and you're going to have your mask on and all of your PPE on and ready to go and you're going to be standing right next to the patient so that when I show up, you're going to say, I've been pushing with this patient for two hours. Looks like the head's right there. She's about to crown. I'm very excited to do this delivery with you. And I'm going to say, good job. All right, these boots are a little bit tricky to put on. The first time you guys start putting on uh, surgical gloves sterilely, again, I'm going to cover that later. Um, it just takes you a long time. And I've definitely seen patients that are pushing and the resident comes in, the faculty comes in, 
um, and they're like getting ready to deliver the baby and then you're off in the corner trying to figure out how do I get this boot on? It's so big, I can't get my foot in there, my foot is stuck, right? And the same thing kind of goes for the gloves and you're over there trying to figure your gloves out and then you look over and sure enough, the baby comes out. Okay, so don't be that student. That's the number one reason why you guys miss deliveries is you're just not ready with all of your stuff. It's a lot more stuff than you're used to in certain your outpatient offices and it's even different stuff than when you're doing um, surgery, right? So make sure that you, on your first day of labor and delivery, ask your intern, ask your resident, where is all this stuff um, in the room for my gowns and my gloves? Where is all the stuff for my boots, my hat, my mask? Um, you should have your own N95. Uh, make sure you've got eye covering. You're going to get amniotic fluid and stuff coming at you. Okay? Boom. So now you're ready for delivery. All right. So before the delivery occurs, it's really important for you to understand sort of the stages of labor. And then we really want you to participate actively in the second stage of labor. This is going to be one of the only times in your life you get to do this. It's really cool. It's a lot of hard work. And you're going to want to do this for various different patients. So the first stage of labor is when patients begin to have regular contractions and then their cervical change, usually dilation. That usually goes from zero one centimeters all the way up to 10 centimeters with full-term uh, pregnant patients. Um, and that is the end of the first stage of labor. So the second stage of labor is the pushing stage of labor. And that begins when the patient starts to push um, and ends with delivery of the baby. The third stage of labor, we're going to go over that at the end, is delivery of the placenta. And that is where the medical student, the third year clerkship, gets to shine. I'm going to show you some pointers on that too. Um, but before we get to the third stage, I kind of want to go over the first stage of labor, the second stage of labor, and then we'll get to that third stage of labor and talk about how you get involved with all that. So first things first, first stage of labor. So quickly, just to go over what the first stage of labor is going to look like for you. Basically, that's when a patient gets admitted to the hospital and she's going through the progress of labor. So sort of the early latent phase where the contractions are a little more infrequent and mild. There's a transition somewhere around four, five, six centimeters where things get way more intense. Then there's the very active phase of labor, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, um, where things are intense. Um, you're going to want to be checking in with your patient every single two hours um, while she's in the latent phase of labor, certainly. Um, if she's got an epidural, that pace kind of continues. If she's unmedicated and going through transition in the active phase of labor, you may be in there with her the whole entire time so you can experience what a natural birth looks like. Um, if you see patients and you're checking in them, making rounds, you definitely want to make a labor progress note. Let the resident or attending know that you wrote one. We can go over that with you. This is a great time to practice reading fetal heart rate tracings. So the second stage of labor. The second stage of labor is the pushing stage of labor. Um, and unless you've pushed a baby up before yourself or been involved with this, um, it's one of those things that we need to coach the patients on how to do this. If Again, if they have an epidural and the majority of our patients do. Um, and so we need to coach you on how to coach uh, the patients. Um, and so... I'm going to go over that right now, and that's the first thing that we're going to cover before we get to actually delivering the baby. All right, so now on to the second stage of labor and on to pushing. So when patients become completely dilated or 10 centimeters dilated, eventually it's going to be time for them to start pushing the baby out. Um, there's a little preparation that happens with the nurse uh, to get this ready, uh, both with the patient and the bed. Um, as well as um, in the charting and so uh, that's another great time to check in with your nurse and see what she needs to kind of get ready for this. Um, a lot of the time we will do pushing with the bed sorted together. I've got it apart here just to kind of show you a little bit more what's going on with the legs and then we're going to move into the delivery pretty quickly. Um, but some of the pushing that we'll do is with the bed together or even just the legs just a little bit lower down. Now when patients push, um, we want patients to push during um, the contractions. Now again, if patients are unmedicated, they don't need to be coached to push uh, for the most part. They are gonna push, um, they're gonna be feeling pretty intense pain, and they uh, almost sometimes don't like to be coached pushing. So you don't need to coach, you don't need to yell at them, you don't need to count for them um, if they're unmedicated. Just let them push, they're usually gonna figure this out. Um, if they need some encouragement or coaching, you know, that's a great time for the nurse to sort of take over. With patients who are pushing with an epidural, however, they don't always have that same urge to push. And so that's where coaching comes in to be very important. 
So when patients push, like I was saying before, we want them to push during the contraction. Okay, contractions last for about 60 seconds, and we want patients to be pushing during sort of the middle 30 seconds of the contraction. So what we're going to ask them to do is push continuously and hard down towards their rectum, down towards their bottom, basically out, um, for 10 seconds. Uh, they're going to take a brief break in between, and then they're going to push for another 10 seconds, another break, and then another 10 seconds. So basically, they're going to be pushing ten, for 10 seconds three times, ideally in the strongest part of the contraction, okay? Um, and what you're going to be doing during that time is you're going to be holding their leg. Now, again, they're going to be, be pretty paralyzed down here from their epidural and not be able to move their leg much. So your job is going to be able to grab the leg, well, get a pair of gloves on, grab the leg, so gently grab the foot, and then support under the leg, and then you're going to want to flex the thigh all the way back to here and hold it here while patients are pushing. This is going to give the patient the opportunity to reach underneath the back of her thigh and then bring herself forward as she pushes. Some patients actually need a little bit of encouragement curling forward and so this is a time that you can reach under the head and help bring her head forward to help her again push down and out. That is the goal. Alright, when you're holding the leg with pushing um, you could be doing this for a while. So I want you guys to push with a first time mom with an epidural, maybe there for a few hours. I want you to push with a first time mom without an epidural, see what that looks like. Then I want you to push with a mom who's had babies before with an epidural, without an epidural. Those go way faster, it might even be one or two pushes. Um, for when you're pushing, um, again, this is a great way to kind of hold the leg and not get too tired yourself because there's work here if you're going to be here for two or three hours. Hold the foot grab under the um, calf and then just hold the leg back. Um, you also can do a little position like this if you want to lean into it a little bit more if you're starting to get tired or need a little bit more resistance against some of those strong patients pushing back. Um, or you can even do something like this and lean a little bit. But just be cautious of the ankle, the foot, and the leg uh, as well as the knee and the thigh when you're doing this. In between pushes you can let these rest down these foot rests or if you're using the stirrup you can have the leg up in the stirrup. Okay, so let's just kind of go through what one push would look like and see how intense it is, right? So the patient's going to maybe feel a little bit of pressure. They're going to see that contraction building up on the monitor. They're going to say, okay, I see another contraction coming. I want you to take a few deep breaths. And we ask patients to take a few deep breaths because... <sighs> that's going to start to put a little extra oxygen into their brain and into their blood. Um, because now we're going to ask them to push real hard, okay, and they're not going to be breathing as deeply. So it's good to take those two cleansing breaths. Um, also, that lets that contraction build up a little bit. So they're pushing at the strongest part of the contraction with it together, right, for the most effect. So it's going to look like this. All right, take those two deep breaths. Deep breath in. Blow it out. Deep breath in. Blow it out. Okay, feel that contraction getting stronger. I want you to take a deep breath in and hold your breath in. Push. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Blow it out and blow it out. Deep breath in and push again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good job. Blow that out. Blow all that air. Blow it in again. One more time and push down hard. Go. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Good job. Okay, I'm going to put your leg down here. I'm going to support your leg. Okay, you're going to want to support the leg, especially if it's very numb with an epidural. You don't want it to fall off, and you're going to kind of just hold and protect that here. And give some encouragement. Great job pushing. That was really good. You did a good job there. I like to provide positive encouragement, even if we're not seeing the baby progressing a whole lot, especially first-time moms who are going to be pushing for a while. Being positive, being positive with them and for them is really important. Um, if they need some encouragement, some of the things that we talk about doing are making sure that they're pushing for the whole 10 seconds. Now, it's a real hard thing to do that. Some people just can't, and that's okay. Just have them blow it out and go right back at it where they can. Um, we are trying to get them to push continuously. For the most part, we push with a closed lattice. means we have them try to hold their breath in and not blow their air out um, and not scream too much when they're pushing. Now, if they're having a lot of intensity and they're going to scream, you know, that's okay, and that's part of labor. Uh, but if they can hold that breath in, they push a little bit more hard, 
harder behind uh, the baby. Um, other things people will do is they'll push sort of up this direction, and it's really important to encourage them to push down and out. Okay, so those are some like basic pointers that will give the nurses who are really take charge in this. And so your job is really just to kind of be there, make sure that you're holding this leg, make sure that the leg is safe and not falling off the um, stirrup, um, and just provide some positive encouragement. You may be here for a while. Um, you may be here at 2 o'clock in the morning till 4.30 in the morning, pushing with the patient. Um, they're going to push for 30 seconds. They're going to get a break. Contractions are going to come every 3 minutes, every 5 minutes, every 10 minutes. Um, and in between, you know, it's a little bit of time to chit-chat if you want to, but you don't necessarily have to. I don't do a whole lot of talking myself. Hopefully you've already met the patient and you know a lot of things. Um, but there may be a little bit of conversation. Try to avoid talking too much about what's on the TV. Uh, try to avoid talking too much about uh, the partner's a job um, and things like that. Um, and just mostly kind of just be there to be supportive and encouraging. All right, so if you know heart rate tracing looks good, that's a great thing to always remind the patient about. Patients will commonly ask if they're making, making progress. The residents may come in, uh, attendings may come in to push a little bit with you and like help with that. Um, the nurse is going to know about that too. So for the most part, hang in here, do a lot of pushing. Um, and as the patient continues to push and push and push, eventually what's going to happen is you're going to see something like this. Right here, you're going to start to see that top of the baby's head. That's called frowning. Okay. So this right here um, is the top of the baby's head that we can see uh, without having to touch the vagina or the perineum. This is probably a time where the, it's going to be you know, getting ready for delivery. If this is a patient who's had a baby before, oh my goodness, I hope a bunch of us are in here getting ready for this. But as, as you're pushing, you're starting to see the head is coming down this low. Um, you know, eventually the nurse is going to start to say, I think it's time to start to call everybody in for delivery. Um, at which point it's going to be okay if you've been there for two hours pushing to say to the nurse, okay, I'm also going to go get ready, get my gown and my gloves on. I'm going to leave this leg here for you. Okay? So the nurse will now take over holding this leg. Often the other leg is being either held by the nurse or by one of the, the family members. Um, and so they're doing some hard work with you too. Okay? So at this point, let's start talking about delivering the baby. So this first part here is called protecting the perineum. Um, as you can see in this mannequin, she has had many, many babies with many, many medical students. Um, she does already have a little bit of a tear in the perineum. Um, one of the first goals of um, being present and assisting with the vaginal delivery is to do your best to prevent um, large tears in the vagina. And we call that protecting the perineum. Uh, as I talk about uh, this with patients in the office, um, it is not uncommon to have a small tear in the vagina. Um, tears get kind of called one, two, three, four degrees. Um, and so a first and second degree tear does happen. I always say vaginas are this big, babies are this big, something's got to give. Um, I tell patients that they haven't done anything wrong if there's a small tear. I haven't done anything wrong if there's a small tear. But what we're trying to do with protecting the perineum is prevent those bigger tears through the muscle, like a third degree laceration or a fourth degree laceration. So we do want to be present and the first part of a delivery is doing that to protect the perineum. Um, to do that, um, what you need to do is you need to apply some pressure to the perineum. So as the head begins to crown and stretch the vulva and the perineum, you want to apply some pressure to the tissue in between the bottom of the vagina and the anus called the perineum. Um, you can either do that with um, your thumb, um, you can do that sort of by pinching all this tissue together, or you can do that by applying some pressure with this part of your hand. All right, the concept is being sort of like the path of least resistance. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to hold pressure there while also putting your fingers on the baby's head to make sure that the baby's head doesn't deliver too quickly. All right, we want to then, after protecting the perineum or like in combination, have what's called controlled delivery of the head. All right, so what I like to do is like take my thumb, index finger, and middle finger of my non-dominant hand kind of hold that against the baby's head just gently. You're not trying to push up too hard and prevent the baby from delivering, but you want to support the head so it doesn't <coughs> pop out too quickly. Um, and at the same time, you're going to be holding um, perineal pressure. All right, so this is what it's going to look like as the head begins to crown. Perineal pressure, holding the um, top of the baby's head so that you have protection of the perineum and a slow controlled delivery of the head.
So here we go, the head's starting to crown. I'm gonna hold my fingers against the baby's head and I'm gonna put some pressure against the perineum. This can be very um, intense time for patients um, while they're pushing even with an epidural. So here comes the head and it's slowly delivering and I'm just making sure it doesn't come flying out and then it delivers nice and slow just like this. Okay, so if you're watching closely, you can see that I've now turned the baby's head to look the other direction. And we're gonna talk about delivering the anterior and the posterior shoulders. So with a slow controlled delivery of the head, you're gonna get the head kinda of out to right about here. And you're actually gonna tell the mom to stop pushing. Um, she stops pushing and the first thing that you wanna do is take your index finger and then just run this over the top of the baby's neck. And this is how we check and make sure that there's not an umbilical cord around the neck or something called a nuchal cord. If there is a nuchal cord, let us know. Most likely we're gonna grab it and we're gonna reduce it over the baby's head. But sometimes we actually have to clamp it and cut it um, and undo it. And that's a time where you're probably gonna have to get out of the way. But as you can see here, there's no cord around the baby's neck. Now, it's really important when we're delivering the anterior and posterior shoulders to hold on to the sides of the baby's face properly. So what you wanna do is have your fingertips facing in the direction of the baby's face and have your thumbs out. Okay, so this baby is uh, looking to my right hand, which makes it now rotating right. I'm gonna have my fingertips pointing towards the mom's left, okay, with my thumbs out, all right, just like this. If the baby was looking this way, I'd have my hands the other direction. That's really important and you need to turn your body to do that. That's actually why I turned the baby over here for the angle with the camera. So here we go, the head has come out, you've told the mom to stop pushing, you check for the nuchal cord, there's no cord. You're gonna put your fingertips on either side of the baby's cheeks and head, your thumbs are out. And now you're gonna to say to her, okay, I need to take a deep breath and push again one more time. Now her pushing is gonna be doing the out. Your job is to push straight down. Don't pull out. What you wanna do is just push straight down because that's gonna get this anterior shoulder under the pubic bone. Her expulsive forces are gonna push the baby out. So it looks something like this. Okay, mom, I need you to push one more time. Go ahead right now, push. So she pushes out as you gently push down to guide the shoulder out. And you're gonna to wanna to do that until you see kind of the top of the baby's shoulder, and the armpit right about here, okay? Once this shoulder has cleared the pubic bone and you can see the armpit, you can stop pushing down. At which point, and again, you're holding the head in that same direction, you can now start to pull up, straight up. She's still pushing out, you're pulling straight up, all right? She pushes straight up. Now, once the baby gets to about here and the posterior shoulder has cleared the sacrum, you then want to now switch to starting to support the baby's head. You do that by bringing your hand around the back of the neck and gently grabbing the back of the neck. You're not like squeezing down. You don't wanna squeeze the front of the neck. You just wanna be around the back of the neck. I always say this is like the little mommy lion grabbing its baby lion. It's okay to hold a baby by the back of the neck it's also a very secure place to support the head and hold the baby. As the mom then pushes the rest of the baby out, your other hand now is gonna go along the back and try to grab a thigh. All right, here I am, and I've got a baby's thigh. This is a great way to hold on to a baby around the back of the neck, gently supporting the head and around the thigh. You will not drop a baby if you're holding around the neck and a thigh. Babies are slippery. Arms are a very bad thing to hold on to. You don't want to do that. Bodies are also slippery, and you don't want to just hold on to the body. All right? Make sure you're grabbing the back of the baby's neck and a thigh. It can be this bottom thigh. That's fine. It can be a bottom thigh like this. That's fine. Um, but this is a great secure way to support the lower body, the upper body, and the head. And then really most importantly, you shouldn't be here very long. At this point, you're just going to want to take the baby and put the baby up on mom's abdomen and hold and support it there. Again, once you've delivered the baby, you're supporting the thigh and the back of the neck, you're gonna to wanna to put the baby up on mom's abdomen, just like this. Now, once the baby's up on mom's abdomen, you don't wanna let it just go right away. These babies are pretty blue, they're also pretty cold, and they're covered in a lot of different stuff. So sometimes the moms don't really wanna hug on their baby right away. Um, but if you let the baby go, it can possibly slip and roll off. So you wanna hold the baby here until the nurse comes over and then she's gonna start to warm and dry the baby. So wait until the nurse comes over to do that. It's gonna look like this. You're holding the baby here and I say to the nurse when she comes over, do you have the baby? And then she will come over, she'll bring a blanket, there's usually one underneath the baby and she'll start to 
dry, stimulate the baby to cry, dry the baby off, warm the baby, flip the baby over, give it a good rub, start sucking out the nose with the bulb. You don't need to do that. She will do that. And then once the baby starts crying and is dried off, we'll put the baby up on mom, okay, just like this. Now that mom's going to hold the baby, the baby's going to be under now a new dry blanket. Um, and we're going to be able to um, give her that um, at least 30 to 60 seconds of delayed cord clamping. Okay, so that's going to let the blood kind of get back to the baby from the placenta. We pretty much do that routinely for all of our deliveries now. Once the um, 30 to 60 seconds or even longer has passed, um, eventually uh, the residents are going to show you how you put the umbi clip on here. You then milk the cord, put a Kelly clamp on right here. Then we'll ask the family member if they want to like cut the cord. Most of them will do that, some don't, in which case the mom can cut the cord or we'll do that. So then the baby will be freed. We'll have the cord down here and we'll give the baby up to start skin to skin with the mom and begin to breastfeed while we move down to um, the uh, delivery of the placenta. Okay, so we are now in the third stage of labor. We've been pushing, in, uh, we've, we've gone through labor with the first stage of labor and gotten it fully dilated. We are pushing in the second stage of labor um, and deliver the baby, and we are now in the third stage of labor. We have clamped and cut the cord, um, and the baby is now um, doing skin to skin with the mom. And so here we are down here with the cord. Now the cord is normally going to have a Kelly clamp on it right here. The first thing that you're going to do is get a small, we have a shot glass here at UConn. Some of our other hospitals have test tubes or there's a little um, like bowl, a metal bowl that you can like collect some cord blood. So you do that by um, holding up here with uh, the Kelly clamp and you'll hold your little glass right here and you just open the Kelly clamp a little bit. Don't let go of the whole cord and let that kind of fill up a little bit into the shot glass. We don't need a whole lot. We'll show you how much you need to do. Um, you put that to the side and then you can kind of let things um, just kind of hang down. There's usually a little bag right here. So this hangs into the bag. You're going to move your Kelly clamp higher up onto the cord and what you're going to do uh, for most of our hospitals is active management of the third stage of labor. So oxytocin is beginning to infuse at some point during all this or before. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to apply gentle core traction while holding suprapubic pressure. Okay, that's really important to hold suprapubic pressure. If you apply core traction and fundal pressure, there's this very rare but very dangerous outcome called uterine inversion where the uterus inverts like a sack very dangerous you don't want to do that so if you're going to massage the fundus which i never do but if you're going to do that make sure you stop cord traction if you're doing cord traction make sure there's superior pressure all right so you're going to again apply that gentle cord traction and you're going to see that the cord is going to start to elongate and when it does that you can take your clamp and you can move it up here again back to superior pressure um, so cord elongation uh, a gush of blood and beginning to see the membranes presenting at the introitus are all signs that the placenta is going to deliver. Now, one thing, I keep saying gentle cord traction, if you pull too hard on the cord, you can rip the cord off. That's called a cord revulsion. So on top of a uterine inversion, a cord revulsion is a big no-no at the third stage of labor. If you rip the cord off, I then need to take my whole hand and put it all the way up into the uterus and grab the body of the placenta and pull it off. And that's a risk factor for retained product's conception. So please, oh please, gently pull on the cord, super pubic pressure. If you start feeling like the cord, like kind of separating a little bit, it'll almost feel like if you were holding onto a thick piano string and it was cut in your hand. So if you start feeling that jerkiness, that's not the placenta separating off. That's the cord separating off from the body of the placenta. Don't pull so hard or just hand this over to my resident or me and let me finish this up so we don't have a cord revulsion. Um, as things go very well, the placenta will separate. We get up to 20 to 30 minutes for this to be a problem. They usually will deliver in the first few minutes. Um, you'll see the cord start to kind of come down, and again, then you're going to see the body of the placenta. As the placenta begins to present itself, what you're going to want to do is get a little bucket. We have these big square plastic buckets that you will put underneath, up against the bed, underneath the mom's bottom. You're going to hold that here with your hip, you're going to maintain superpubic pressure, and what you're going to do is you're going to deliver the placenta out to the body. What we, um, if you can, what we like to do is try to like rotate the placenta a little bit so the membranes kind of get all bunched up and don't get left behind. And then you're going to gently deliver the placenta into the bucket. All right. So then you grab the bucket, and you're going to put the placenta over onto the uh, table.
Now, once the placenta is delivered, this is a time to start doing pretty vigorous fundal massage. With the oxytocin infusing and fundal massage, the uterus is going to squeeze down and that's going to cut off the bleeding. Um, once we're reassured that there's not a lot of heavy bleeding, we're going to start to begin to do an inspection. So the inspection starts by looking at the perineum all the way from the bottom part of the introitus to the anus and seeing what tears are on the skin of the perineum. We're going to look um, on the inside of the introitus here to see if there's any extensions of this uh, uh, laceration into the um, perineal muscles. Um, then we're going to look further up into the vagina and see if there's any vaginal extensions, see if there's any sulcus tears. Those are tears that go up the side of the vagina. Then we're going to look and inspect to see if there's any tears on the cervix. And then also we're going to look at the rest of the vulva to see if there's any tears uh, on the labia up by the urethra or the clitoris. All right, so we do full inspections of all the areas of possible trauma. Um, at this point, if there's any tears, um, this is where my resident and myself are going to do the repair. It's very um, unlikely that you as a third year medical student are going to do this repair. Um, we use local anesthetic for this as well as the epidural. Um, even with that, it's a very sensitive part for a patient to have sutures. There's often continuous lochia coming down, and the anatomy is going to look very abnormal to you. So your role as a third-year medical student is going to be some gentle retraction. Um, also have a pair of scissors ready so that you can cut the suture um, when we tie our knot um, for the beginning end or middle of the suturing, um, as well as have a, a gauze in your hand so that you can dab when uh, in between suturing. When you're dabbing with the gauze, just make sure that needle is taken away. You don't want to, like, while somebody's suturing, put a gauze in there and dab. You're going to get poked by the needle. We really don't want that to happen. Okay? So um, after some time, we'll have done the laceration repair. We'll make sure that everything is hemostatic and do one last inspection. Um, at that point, it's just um, doing a needle count, a sponge count, um, and making sure that all of our instruments are taken care of. Um, and we clean up the patient, and we get her um, out of these stirrups into the recovery position. Participating in vaginal deliveries is an extremely rewarding and exciting experience for OBGYN clerkship students. It is a very memorable time in our patients' lives. I have three older children. I remember all of the deliveries like it was yesterday. Hopefully some of these pointers around how to meet the nurse before you even go in to meet the patient, and then learning about the first stage of labor and your role there. Um, learning how to coach patients and assist with the second stage or pushing in labor, and then some of the pointers on what to do with your body and your hands, protecting the perineum, assisting with uh, the vaginal delivery of the infant, getting the infant up on the abdomen safely, warmed and dry, then moving on to the third stage of labor of delivering the placenta safely and completely, and then assisting with any of the repairs. Those are all things that I think should be very helpful to you as you prepare to be involved with our deliveries. Last but not least, take some time to enjoy the moment. The patients are gonna be very excited that you were part of this birth experience with them. It's totally okay if you wanna bond with the baby and bond with the family. They may request to take some pictures, that's completely up to you, um, but it is a nice moment to get to share with the, uh, with the patient, uh, with the family. One last pointer. These babies are still pretty gross when they've come out. We actually do delayed bathing, which means that they won't get baths for the first 24 hours. Um, so they're gross. Uh, every time you touch a baby, you're gonna wanna wear gloves like I am right here. Uh, they're very cute, but they're still covered in all sorts of stuff from that delivery. It's healthy and it's good for them, but it's a little nasty for you. So just make sure you wear those gloves as you're celebrating the delivery. I hope you find this video helpful. We look forward to having you on the OBGYN clerkship. Bye-bye.